I'm Gordon Brickell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com or, of course, on Instagram at filmmaker underscore you. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work. And this week, I'm joined by director Trevor Anderson, uh, whose latest work is a feature film called Before I Change My Mind. Welcome to the show, Trevor. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Um, I guess this is your first feature film, and you've done several shorts. So how? What were some of the difficulties or or what challenges that you faced in transitioning from short to feature length in the storytelling process? For me, it was the script. My imagination kept bringing me ideas for short films and it wasn't bringing me ideas for a feature film for the longest time. And I was really getting frustrated. I was banging my head against kind of it felt like a wall you know and 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 um then i thought what is going on here what's the problem and my short films had earned me a reputation that they were kind of formally innovative that's what people would say about the programmers and film festivals and i i realized my problem was that i'd let that go to my head and i was trying to be too clever i was trying to come up with an idea for a feature film that would be formally innovative and you know i come from a theater background i did a lot of improv theater and if you're trying to be clever that's death so i stopped it and i thought what's actually what's the most cliche thing i can think of and it's the semi-autobiographical coming of age film so i wrote out a really um fast story outline for that uh, and then I showed it to my great friend, Fish Gurkowski, and um, he put a little twist on it. He said, what if when the kid walks in at the beginning of the movie, nobody else can tell if they're a boy or a girl? And a light bulb went on for me because it felt more true emotionally to mm -hmm. my experience, even though I hadn't put it in my story outline. And you know how your friends sometimes know you a little better than you know yourself or have a perspective that you don't. Um, so it both felt true and added that formal twist that I had been hoping for, because then mm -hmm. we quickly realized, oh, cool, what if actually we never then determine a gender for the hero of the movie? Can you do that? What would happen if you just avoided gendering your hero? And mm -hmm. I mean, I certainly don't mean to imply that in 1987, Alberta, this kid was getting away with not gendering himself. <laughs> Certainly off camera, there'd be gendered yeah. pronouns, there'd be gendered gym uniforms. But I just thought, you know, what if we just don't ever point the camera at that? What would happen? And that became the element of formal experimentation that I wanted. Uh, and in a way, it kind of let us dig deeper into the emotions. And then it became much more about not just what are you? Are you a boy or a girl? But it became about what are you? Like, what kind of person are you? What are you willing to do to fit in? Are, you know, uh, how do you treat other people? And who likes me? And do they like me back? And do I, no, I mean, do I like them back? And who do I like? And do they like me back? And, you know, all those questions that are really pressing in grade eight. And, you know, Am I a good person? Which is a question that I think all of us can always ask ourselves all through our lives. I've been a camera person for 30 years and I fell in love with cinema. I heard there was free film school in France and I wanted to get into the French film school. I really didn't know anything at the time, but I knew at least how to take pictures. So I said, I'll try for the image department. And then when I miraculously <laughs> got into the French film school, I fell in love with working with the camera. You're following what's going to be in the movie. So that immediacy that the camera allows is what I loved from the beginning. I'm Kirsten Johnson, and this is my course about documentary cinematography. What's interesting is, so when I was watching it, I was sitting there and I was like, it's it's set in the 80s. And I was thinking about the difficulties, you know, being non-gendered in the 80s might be, right? And there's sort of that sort of set of difficulties that a person would have gone through. And then I think about nowadays where we have all these, you know, like in Alberta, they just, they're in the process of passing a law against 
trans the transgender community. Uh, so there's this whole other set of problems. And so I'm wondering, um, what was it about the challenges of the 80s that made you want to, like for your characters, that made you want to set it in that time? Robin wouldn't have had language to describe what they were going through. Just like I didn't really have language to describe what I was going through. And I think that that's specific to a character who's maybe, who knows something's up with their gender or maybe who they're attracted to, but doesn't have any vocabulary for it. That for me allowed a feeling of blurriness that I think is accurate to that age, emotionally. Like adolescence is such a blurry time. And then it also let us expand out to the adult characters. And we wanted to have some form of unanswered question for every character in the movie, all the kids, all the adults. We thought, what are the unanswered questions around this person that maybe the movie never answers? And for me, that just feels more like what life is like. Everybody's got unanswered questions about themselves and things that are, you know, that are in play and that they're trying to figure out. And it just makes... Uh, it makes it feel more vital and and realistic to me for to have characters who don't have all the answers. Um, certainly, it was a, a point of conversation because the young actor who plays Robin is Vaughn Murray, who can easily say, I'm non-binary and my pronouns are they, them. Uh, and if Robin had had that power to walk in at the beginning of the movie, I'm Robin, I'm non-binary and my pronouns are they, them. Uh, okay. So, you know, yeah. it, it, there's no room for that feeling of not having language for something that's going on. And I don't even mean to say that I think Robin is non-binary because some people watch this movie and see a trans boy. And some people watch this movie and see Robin as a cisgender gay boy. And uh, I don't want to take that viewing experience away mm -hmm. from anybody. Um, and for me, that's kind of the experiment is how, how choose your own adventure can the hero be and still invite the audience to come along on a clear emotional journey. It's I, so you sort of touched on it there uh, about sort of, I guess, for lack of a better word, like the muddiness of our teen years where it's like, we're all trying to figure out who we are. And like, so when you were developing this, these stories, like these, each of the characters are sort of in that muddy water, trying to figure out who they are. Yeah. I want to know, like, did you pull from your personal life? Like, did you pull from other stories? Or was this something that was just came out when you were writing? The story started off really autobiographical. And mm -hmm. then as I worked with my writing partner. It became semi-autobiographical. And in the end, it's fiction. Mm -hmm. But what I like to say is it's it's fiction about true feelings. So I feel like the emotions of the piece are documentary to me. Like it's really, I know all the emotions of this piece. I lived them. Mm -hmm. But the characters and the situations and the plot are fiction. So, it, it, you know, like, you know, those emotions. So as a director, how did you communicate those to your actors or get that out of your actors who might not have experienced that? It's a, it's a funny thing. Uh, casting is everything. You know, you, mm -hmm. you got to be so careful in the audition process. But if you get the right actors, you don't have to take them by the hand and lead them to the character. You know, you, you, you can tell in the audition if the actor has a instinct for that character. Mm -hmm. And if you get it right, there's not a lot of explaining you have to do on set certainly these days around gender and sexuality you don't have to tell kids nothing yeah but uh all of our conversations were about bangs like i wanted to give all the little girls 80s <laughs> bangs, and of course yeah. no way if i had done that there'd be so many tears on set so um <laughs> yeah it was more about like fashion and hairstyles were the real conversations we were having yeah. as far as the emotional arcs for those characters the kids were just bringing that naturally Interesting. I do have to ask you about the musical or the because yeah. I loved it and I guess I have two questions one I know you did a music musical short and I want and you did work in theater in and I'm wondering what you took from that uh, experience that you know people might not have realized you need to know when making a musical scene that you used on the feature but I also want to know are you ever going to spin that musical off to off broadway or something you know it's a question i get asked i'm so glad that people are responding for the people who are listening who haven't seen the movie yet it's a stage play within the film it's a community theater the 
director of the community theater shows up in the classroom. He's played by me. I'm playing the theater director, Mr. Anderson, as a parody of myself. And, you know, who wants to be in a musical? And uh, the community theater was going to do Jesus Christ Superstar, but couldn't get the rights. So, uh, you know, my character had to write uh, an original musical from Mary Magdalene's point of view, which led us to a satire of Jesus Christ Superstar. And my former bandmate from The Wet Secrets, I was in a band called The Wet Secrets with Lyle Bell. And um, he and I, uh, and my writing partner, Fish Krakowski, we wrote all the original songs for Mary Magdalene videos. I was a musical theater kid in Red Deer. That's where I started. And I trained uh, as an actor uh, in university. And then I worked in the theater for 10 years before I started making short films and before I made this feature film. So in a way, this is this is my roots. My roots are showing in, in, in the musical section of this film. I, like you say, I did make a musical short film called The Man That Got Away. I would love to make a feature length musical at some point in my life. Um, I don't think it'll be Mary Magdalene video star. I think <laughs> maybe, maybe leave them wanting more on that one. Yeah. Though people are asking about the songs to the degree that I think I had better make a band camp page and get the songs at least available for people to hear again. Oh, but for sure. I, I could maybe see myself pitching a series about a community theater uh, where, you know, the series could go from who wants to be in a musical all the way to the opening night after party. And that could be the maybe eight episodes. If I could get someone interested in that, I could explore you know, the backstage musical around Mary Magdalene video mm -hmm. star a little more. But just as a straight up Mary Magdalene video star on its own, I don't think we'll ever quite do that. But oh. to your question about craft and what people who maybe want to shoot a musical a sequence or a musical short film, uh, what I had to learn by doing it was like just the logistical process of how you do that. Um, and it was new to me as a discovery to learn that you really, you you record the music first and it doesn't have to be fully um, uh, arranged. The instrumentation doesn't all have to be there, but the tempo needs to be there and the vocal performance needs to be there pre-recorded. So that then on the day when you're filming, you're doing it to playback. You've got speakers and you're, you're calling for playback. That begins with usually a metronome click to lead you in. And then people are... I don't want to say lip syncing along with themselves to film because if you just lip sync, it looks fake because the breathing's not right. So people should be singing along with themselves when you film and then the breathing looks correct. Uh, and then you just wind up um, swapping out the audio uh, in post-production. So th that, that logistical step of record the vocal performance first to be able to sing along with on the day you're shooting was the um, the penny drop for me logistically now there's two things i would i want to comment on what you said first is i love the part where he said he couldn't get the rights <laughs> and i would like to know was that sort of like a poke at the canadian funding system or was that because i like a lot of times when i'm working on a project it'll be like yeah we can't get the rights to that song so we're not touching that you know or something like that for me it was a poke at my own um, entitled imagination. It started with, and then we'll do Jesus Christ Superstar. And my producers went, um, no, we won't. But of course it becomes a gift. The parody of Jesus Christ Superstar that we wrote became more popular and more effective uh, more fun for an audience than if we had the rights to simply doing Jesus Christ Superstar. Similarly, at one point in the movie, the kids rent a video and they're gonna watch a movie. And I was hell bent on getting Carrie. We were going to be have them watching Brian De Palma's Carrie, and the producers were very gentle and said, "No, we're not going to get the rights to Carrie at our budget level." Um, and I pouted for a minute, and then you know my writing partner Fish said, "It's the same thing. It's a gift. We'll make our own film within the film, Satan's Seedlings, and shoot a few scenes of that, and that's what the kids are watching." And, so that gets a laugh in from the audience and it, it helps us create a world. It, it's another opportunity for world building. Mm -hmm. Well, and and so um, I guess, what was the inspiration for Mary Magdalene Video Star? That we wanted Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus so it was just like, <laughs> yeah, it was. It. I thought afterwards you were like, okay, let's build <laughs> a, a different end, piece. 
you know how it is. You 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 get you want something, you get something, you wind up with something, and then you realize what a gift it is. And so as mm -hmm. we were writing, as we were working, the real payoff is that um, you know, Mary Magdalene famously was Jesus in a relationship with Mary Magdalene. You know, she was the sex worker <laughs> character. I'm gonna say character, I don't want to offend anybody, but you know, in the Jesus story, she's the um the the you know lady of the night who yeah. was close with jesus and 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 so there's that debate of like what was their relationship which lets us in the parody stage musical mary magdalene can say to jesus like what even are we boyfriend and girlfriend or what <laughs> which becomes a satirical level of what our actual characters are going through because um robin and carter what is that relationship are mm -hmm. we friends is it more Carter and Izzy what's going on are we friends is it more do I like you do you like me and then the adults the parents the father of Robin and the mother of Izzy they're kind of flirting and are we going to go on a date so it, it just becomes an opportunity for us to play with the themes of our real movie at a level of parody halfway through the movie for a bit of comic relief but also to line up the themes of the movie stack them so it's like your own version of Wicked. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> yeah. Or Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Journey with music. <laughs> yeah, great. Oh, I love Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. What, well, then I've got to ask, what? because as a person who loves musicals and theater, what is your your favorite musical or theater piece? I don't have a favorite. It's ones that I love. I grew up on Funny Girl. I loved Funny Girl. I was definitely a Funny Girl gay. Um, then I got to Sondheim and, you know, I love, especially Into the Woods. I really love what Into the Woods does with story mm -hmm. um, and awareness of story and how we use stories in our life. Um, and there's a little known now musical. Uh, I mean, it wasn't little known in the 70s, but it's maybe little known now called um, On the 20th Century. And I really love that musical. There's an original cast recording with Madeline Kahn in it. It's just great. Oh, and yeah. Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein. Uh, yeah, it's a great musical. Awesome. Now, you shot this on a shoestring budget. Yeah, um, we did. How, so similar to one of my other questions, you know, we have a lot of young people watching this who are just trying to get their feet wet in the film industry. So, like, what are some things you learned from shooting on a shoestring budget that people should be aware of we wouldn't have been able to do it without the goodwill of the crew uh we had i think around seven hundred thousand dollars to shoot this movie and in the end i'm proud to say that i think it looks like about 2.5 million pretty impressive um considering like every film i see listed in canada is usually around like 2.5 <laughs> yeah right. we only had 700 but it should have been 2.5 yeah but because of the goodwill of the crew uh and because i'd been a member of that community for so long and because everybody had been watching me make 12 shorts and everybody knew it was time for a feature and we we did our best to raise 2.5 million but in the end we only had about 700 and everybody just went well fine we're gonna make it work and this is not something i would want to do over and over in my career i wouldn't want to it would become taking advantage of people if i kept mm -hmm. asking for that to happen uh, but certainly I accepted their generosity and the difference, the difference between 2.5 million and 700,000, that's all their sweat equity. That's their, um, willingness to just make this movie happen. So what's the advice there? Um, it's a business of relationships. Um, I always say don't network, make friends because <laughs> <laughs> it's friends you're going to need. Um, and how do you make friends? You be a good friend. So yeah. I, you know, maybe it's coming from community theater. Maybe it's coming from a smaller place originally, like the Edmonton theater community. But it is really the personal friendships you have with people that are your greatest resource, oh. especially at 3 a.m. when you lose <laughs> faith and you're yeah. having your dark night of the soul. You better have some friends you can text who've got your back. So <laughs> it's put in the effort, be a good friend yeah. and be, be, be a member of a community. Now, is there, 
so you know when i was researching for this i had seen various um you know, questions spent to, sent to uh, sent to you about you know like what's your favorite this, what's your favorite that. But is there a particular moment uh, in the film or like a scene or a performance that uh, you were just really proud of that you got to work? The ending is tricky. The ending, mm -hmm. the last fifteen minutes of the film, the tone changes, and I can talk about it without giving it away to the audience who haven't seen it. But um, I know that for some audiences, it members it works uh i know from reading letterbox for some audience members it doesn't work. <laughs> you know don't, don't read the don't read the letterbox <laughs> that's my real advice to emerging filmmakers don't yeah. read the letterbox reviews but when i see it with an audience and i feel that moment work when i feel the tone change in the last 15 minutes of the film it's a tricky thing to do because you want to lay a trail of breadcrumbs for the audience where they don't see it coming, but once it happens, it feels earned. And you can look back and see the clues that were leading you to, oh, something like that is maybe gonna happen. When you, in hindsight, you can see how it makes sense, but uh, you don't see it coming. That That's a tricky thing to try to do. And so when I'm sitting in an audience and I can feel it work and I can feel the audience go along with the intensity of the last 15 minutes, uh, with these three-dimensional characters that hopefully we've earned this from. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a, it's hard to say without giving it away, but there's a tender moment at the end between Robin and Tony. Yeah. Uh, that there's always an audible reaction in a theater to how much of an emotional relief it is to see these two kids connect like that. Um, that for me is like when I know, oh good, they came along on the ride. Now, I have one last question for you. What would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film or TV show to watch? Guilty pleasure implies that it's not something that you would feel impressive saying. Like I can easily <laughs> yeah. say now my favorite thing is feud Capote yeah. versus the oh, that's a good one. That, that's not a guilty pleasure. That's just a pleasure. That's everyone knows mm -hmm. that's stuff. Um, what is my guilty pleasure? film or tv show i mean I, am i such a basic gay that i'm gonna say rupaul's drag race As i'm so yeah. sick of it i'm so sick of rupaul's drag race but i watch it and it hurts <laughs> me so i guess maybe it's just as a basic gay answer like rupaul's drag race for a guilty pleasure well thank you so much for letting me interview today thank you very much for taking the time i appreciate it and that's it for this week, everyone. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com or, of course, on Instagram at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Raquel. Thanks for watching.